So I had to box abroad because women's boxing was illegal in the UK. She was the first girl sanctioned to fight by the British Boxing Board of Control. So she turned boxing history around. Got kicked out of Fleetwood for boxing because the fella that owned the gym in Fleetwood was against women's boxing. He went, listen, you've got to fuck off out of here. The girl had had 27 fights, 27 knockouts. They even had the French president there to give her the belt. And then I just come along and just street fighted her. And I just won her because I was harder than her. That was the only difference between me. She was more skilled. She was better looking, <laughs> she had all the titles, but I just had heart and desire to bring women's boxing to England. A woman's boxing champion has won her claim against the British Boxing Board of Control. The board had refused to give Jane Couch a license to box professionally, arguing that premenstrual tension made women unstable. And then all of a sudden, he was like, women should be boxing, they're all lesbians, and they're all this, and they're all that, and they're, they're wrong, and then, Frank Maloney, who didn't want women to box, turned into a fucking woman. <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck happened there? Like, where did that go wrong? Here I am, I got introduced introduce you to my first guest. And the reason this person is my first guest is because when I first come out of jail and I started this rehabilitation, when I started working with kids, this beautiful human being, who you'll learn all about in a minute, was the first person to ever interview me. So let me pass you over. What's your name? Jane Couch, MBE, five-time world boxing champion and the 2024 inductee into Boxing Hall of Fame. You can't get any bigger than that for bruh, your first bruh, bruh. guest. I'm honored to be sat here with you, you know. I'm a I'm massive- more I'm more honored to be sat with you. No, but I'm a massive fan, Daryl. I interviewed you all them years ago and what you do for the community and for people, you're just, you're just a legend. Thanks. Not as much of a legend as you. So, Jane, let's, let's crack on. Where are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Not a little bit about yourself. Everything, Everything about yourself. Everything. Well, yeah, okay. So, born and bred in Fleetwood. Where are we now? We're in Fleetwood. We're on... North, we're in North Albert Street Cafe, right opposite the library. You're going for fish and chips after here, so we better get a move on. We nearly got locked out of North Albert Street Actually, Cafe. North Albert Street Cafe kicked them out when they got here. But when I told them who he was, they let us back in. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I was born and bred in Fleetwood, Darrell, um, and took a, a boxing at the age of 21 very late because women's boxing was illegal in the UK. A lot of people don't know that. And um, so I had to box abroad. I had to train in Bristol because it was illegal. And I had to box in Denmark, in Europe, in Jamaica, in the States, in Atlantic City. And then I won my first title in Denmark and I did a TV interview with Michael Barrymore and a solicitor from London saw the TV interview and saw that it was illegal for women to box. So she she phoned me at the training camp in Bristol because I had to move out of Fleetwood. I got kicked out of Fleetwood for boxing because the fella that owned the gym in Fleetwood was against women's boxing. And he went, listen, you've got to fuck off out of here because we don't have women. So that was the start of it. So the journey was just like trying to get it Recognised, I won the world title in Denmark um, and then I went on to defend in New Orleans. And then in 1997, we took a court case to get women's boxing uh, legalised into the UK. Uh, me and two solicitors, one, one was the solicitor, a woman, Sarah Leslie, and Dinah Rose was the barrister. So three women took on the corrupt boxing board of control because they was like, nah, you're not, you're not having women's boxing. We don't want women's boxing. And they did everything they could to stop it. So we just carried, cracked on. I carried on fighting. I was boxing abroad, coming back, boxing abroad, going back into training camp. And my whole life for 26 years was just train, 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 court action, 
get in the court case ready. And because I was already a five, like at the time I was like, I think two times world champion. So I was already making a living abroad, not a great living because I want a lot of money as it is now, but I was still making a living and still being able to box abroad. And then the court case came, we embarrassed the boxing board of control. And then the rest is history. It was just like, wow, women can box. So it's thanks to you really that we have these great, great boxers, not just saying boxes, these great boxing events or women's boxing events nowadays. So it's, it's thanks to you. So we need to applaud you for that. I don't think many people will know no. it's thanks to you. Yeah, and also, so when we was at the court case, there was no amateur boxing. I couldn't even box as an amateur because that was illegal too for the amateurs. So Rod, Commander Rod Robertson, who ran the amateur boxing at the time, was at the court case. And it was because he heard what happened in the court of how sexist the, the boxing board really were that he allowed amateur boxing to begin. And then... With the amateur boxing, you got Tasha Jonas, you got all the girls, Savannah Marshall, all the girls that come through to the Olympics. And that's when people sort of took notice of it because of the Olympics, but there wouldn't have been any of it if we hadn't took the court case. Right. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm worthless at this moment. But you know, when you started saying you're boxing at 21, you know, your child and all that, were you getting in fights then? Yeah. Why was you wanting to box? Well, because so my brother was in a punk rock band and, and Fleetwood is a, a deprived fishing town. And in the 70s, when I grew up, there was still a bit of fishing here. So the, you still had the three day millionaires coming over from sea. So you could get a few quid off the fishermen. But later on, as I got into the 80s and 90s, it really declined in Fleetwood. And all there was to do really was to fight. If I went to a gig with my brother, they was like trying to rob the drum kit and I'd be like, it's it, get him, Jane. And they was all older than me. So Ronnie McLeod, Tommy Couch, Gav Gob, they, they all taught me how to fight and how to look after myself. You was like one of the lads. Yeah, I was like a real, real tomboy. Was, going back to your childhood, how was your childhood? Yeah, good. Like, um, you know, it, they say like, Oh yeah, but you're from a deprived town and we had no money, but that's what made us what we were because we all stuck together as a community and we all, every house on the street was like, that was your cousin or your auntie or your neighbour knew that one. And it, it was a real close knit community. And for me to have to leave because all I wanted to do was box was it just heartbreaking. I had to leave my family and my friends and go down to Bristol, where they all sport funny here, and my lover, and and put up with me, and it, it it was a great childhood. We didn't have anything. We we had nothing. But you had each other. But we had each other, and we and there was no abuse, and there was no nothing. No, and in them days, there was not really any drugs about. So we we were just fighting to survive, really. And my brother was in the punk rock band that was doing quite well. And he went off to America. So I, as a young kid, I was watching him leave me in Fleetwood. I'm like, what am I going to do? So they'd already taught me to look after myself and to defend myself. So you come from the era where punk and mods and... Yeah. yeah. Them kind I of was people, a punk. <laughs> do you know? And Vespers and Lambrettas. Yeah. Them kind of days. Them so how many days. brothers and sisters do you have? Just one brother, Tommy. And did you grow up with your both parents or one parent? Just one parent, just my mum. Single mum, yeah. household. Yeah, single mum. Um, obviously, mum was dating a fisherman, Lenny Smith. Um, so he was like a free day millionaire when he come home. So they'd, get, they'd land the fish and, they'd, and we'd have money for three days. A three day millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd have nothing. We'd have absolutely nothing till he landed again. But you had love. But we had, yeah, we had each other and we had community. And no matter what, we would have died for each other because we were so close. Even now, Ronnie, Tom, Gav, Hully, all of them were all still very, very close to this day. That's amazing. That's, we're all really still good friends. It's brilliant. It's mad, isn't it? Because as people grow up and they grow apart, you know, yeah. go, move out of town and people forget about each other. So you just still got that sense of We've friendship. Got, yeah. Camar over, camaraderie. 
So I never seen Ronnie McLeod and Ollie and Gaz, Gav for 25 years because I had to move and I, and I travel the world and I was 30 years on the road. So I never saw, saw any of them for that long. And then I come back like last year and it's like I never left, just like I never left. Yeah. So what, so what are you doing now? So what happened was I wrote the book through the final round and the book was picked up by a, a film company, uh, North of Watford Films. And they've just been to Fleetwood now. And they think Fleetwood's amazing. It's just an amazing place and they love the community spirit, even though it's not what it was. It, it's not what it was when we was in the 70s, but it's still got that little bit of community spirit. So they've um, they've commissioned a film to start being shoot, shot in October in Fleetwood. They've got a massive budget and they're going to spend it in Fleetwood. So in a way, it's gone full circle because... I left with nothing, and then I've come back and brought Invested, investments and opportunities for a lot of other people. It's an opportunity for Fleetwood to get a bit of investment because that's all Fleetwood needs. And to know. get put on the map, so to speak. I, I yeah. know this is a community because me and you just walked over to the bakery and <laughs> everybody knows who you are. In the bakery, everybody was nice. Um, everybody in Fleetwood seems to have ADHD like myself and you. <laughs> So, <laughs> here, because there's a lot of us here, but yeah, we are still a community. And even though, like, I don't know a lot of the younger ones, but I know the mums and dads, and I know the granddads, and the you know, the family. It's the community is something that you go a long way to find. Liverpool is probably as close as you get because Liverpool's still got that community. Yeah. I've, yeah, Liverpool, I've got... My Liverpool, I'm from Manchester, but Liverpool is my favourite yeah. place in the world and they do have that sense of community. And as you know, I have some friends up there that is mad because you was my friend from 13 years ago and Tash has always been my friend in its way. I was both box, you're both world champions. Go, what, what titles did you actually win? So I had five world titles. I had two at... Um, I had three at light welterweight and two at lightweight. So in them days, the WBA and the WBC didn't sanction it. So it was like the WBF, uh, IFBA, it was like WBA. So, and it was only just coming then. And I was boxing on in America on like same bill as Lennox Lewis, same bill as Naz, on all the big shows on TV there. But the belts were not the same as the men's. So it was just growing and growing and then you had Lucy Riker, you had Am Wolf, who was an absolute monster. Like Am would have beat a lot of men. She was just an amazing, amazing fighter. <laughs> I reckon you'd beat a lot of men. <laughs> <laughs> I would, yeah. Like I have beat a lot of men. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm an advocate against domestic violence, so we won't talk about men beating women, women beating men. <laughs> In the but, gym, I yeah, mean, I know. I was always joking. Like when I go, when I used, to, when, when I left Fleetwood, I was a, <clears throat> I was a complete novice. I head down, just fought like that, and bags at dawn. When I got to Bristol, the wake up call was absolutely smashed me in the face. It was like I was sparring with professional boxers, like English champions, British champions, world champions. I remember sparring with Dean Francis and. You couldn't have hit him with a bag of rice. He was that good, that good. And for me, the change done me good because I was like, wow, if these are that good, what are the women in America like? Because America was like eight years ahead of us. So so when I'm fighting like I'm Wolf, Lucy Araika, that, that class of people, I'm going in blind really. And then they put me in a fight in Denmark the girl had had 27 fights, 27 knockouts. They even had the French president there to give her the belt. And then I just come along and just street fighted her. And I just won her because I was harder than her. That was the only, the only difference between me. She was more skilled. She was better looking. <laughs> she had all the titles, but I just had heart and desire to bring women's boxing to England. And, and that, I wasn't going to give up till That's I did. more like a dog fight, isn't it? A, Re dog fight, a yeah. dog fight, really. Yeah. You kind of like when yeah. I'm done her in her own backyard. Yeah. For, 
they're kind of like underestimated you by bringing a friend president and things like that. 27 fights, 27 wins, 27 KO. But they ain't knocking out RJ. No. She nearly did in the second round. In fact, I'll show you the video. But she didn't. And I toppled over and I thought, was it Market Tavern? I was like, whoa. But I came back because it was so fit to trade, so hard with some amazing boxers for the fighters. And then, then I thought, oh, well, I've won the world title now. That's going to open all the doors in England. Came back to England. Nobody even knew that I'd been there. I boxed in, f in front of like 8 million people in Denmark, beat their champion in her backyard, and nobody even knew that I'd gone. And I come back and I was like, wow, like, this needs to change. Yeah, um, I'm like, can I just go back to uh, when you was younger? Nowadays, you know what the work I do in our community is with knife crime. And back in them days, there was no knife crime around there, but how was it? How was it then and how is it now around there? So the difference between then and now, I think, is drugs. When we was kids growing up, I, we'd never heard of drugs. We didn't ever hear of it in the 70s. And, you, and, and Fleetwood is known for drink because fishermen come in, drink for three days, go back to sea. So that's all I really knew. And the drink side of it wasn't great. You know, it, they come home, get drunk and then go back to sea. So there wasn't much... There wasn't much interaction with your with your dad or your granddad or anything because they were just pissed up and then back to sea. But what what they did have is th that community spirit and that care that you don't see. But you never ever ever heard a knife crime or anybody getting stabbed. If if I had a row, even with someone five years older, a boy, you were made to go outside and have a street fist fight with them. On Albert Street, you know, many a time I fell out with the lads in Albert Street and they've gone, right, get out. You've got to have a fight in front of everyone. And when I, I got a job at the scrapyard when I first left school, it was the same there. If you had a row with somebody, you had to go outside and you had to fight. So, and I've always been brave. I've never been scared of anything because of the way Tom and the boys brought me up because I was a real tomboy. And they used to say, don't ever back down, don't ever give in. But there was never, ever a gun, a knife. There was nothing. It was just fat. I got battered loads of times. Loads of times. But, when you live to tell the tale. But yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you proud of your achievements? Mm, yeah. I, I, I sometimes... I sometimes don't realise what I've done. And then... We're working on the film at the minute, so you have to go back. And I was going back through the videos and they sent me a little clip of the preview of the film. And I was like, wow, I actually did all right. <laughs> you don't, but you don't, while you're living that, because I was living on a farm in the middle of nowhere with a trainer that was 72. I never went out. I couldn't eat because I had no money. I couldn't afford to go out. And I was miles away from the nearest village, if I got, went out to ring my mum, I had to like borrow like 10 peas off the girls in the stables and walk through a field to ring my mum from the phone box. And then it was just so hard, but I don't know what kept me going. I think when you've got a desire to, to, to do something, I think sport or non-sport, I think, You'll do it. Tenacity and resilience. Yeah, and, I, and the way I, I am, I'm, I'm quite obsessive, quite compulsive and do just off-the-cuff things. So a lot of people didn't like me because I'd say the wrong thing. I think that's a bit like <laughs> me. I know that's a bit like... I, I say it as it is. Yeah. People who go out with me, they cringe about what's yeah. going to come out of my mouth. Yeah. And it's only like Mark from Base Security and Tasha when we're out where... Yeah. They know something's gonna come out, and they don't cringe. They always got my back. And and I, that's what I think. When I first interviewed you all them years ago, I didn't even know you'd just come out of jail. Didn't really know anything about you. But my first impressions of you was like, oh my god, he's just like me, because of the way that you, <laughs> you you answered and the way that you spoke. But also, you was very confident in yourself. But because you know the game, you know about knife crime, you know about drugs, you know about fighting. And I know about, listen, let's be honest, I know everything about boxing. And if it wasn't for me, 
There would be no women boxers. Yeah, we know, we know that. We really know that and we do take our And out. that's why, that's where your confidence comes from. That's where your confidence comes from because you know your stuff. You're a genuine, genuine fan. That's no. that's all I can be. I can only I can only be real, you yeah. know. Now, but now fake is a new real. I need to ask you this: when it comes to boxing and promoters, who are the promoters that didn't want women in the game? Well, there you go. I mean, this is my my story. It, it's just unbelievable, and this is laughable because then there was a promoter called Frank Maloney, and he managed Lennox Lewis, and he was little and he wore the Union Jack suit. And then all of a sudden, he was like, women should be boxing. They're all lesbians and they're all this and they're all that and they're, they're wrong. And then Frank Maloney, who didn't want women to box, turned into a fucking woman. <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck happened there? Like, where did that go wrong? I'm sorry for laughing, but I can't help it. I've got to keep it real. <laughs> That's laughing. How do you think I felt? That's why I picked up my tea when you when you started saying about Frank Maloney. But yeah, Frank Maloney you called Kelly Maloney now. What a twat! What a twat! He thought he was going. Oh yeah, you should be boxing, and I think women's boxing. And at the time, the fucker had all the sky shows, and and I'm like, please, please, Frank. I know you think that we're all cunts, but just let me box, like begging him for a fight. And then he's speaking to you like that. And then I thought, do you know what? Fuck. Well, you know what? They're not gonna make a film on his life story, are they? Or, or her life story. Yeah, or see you later, him, Kelly. Shim, whatever. Shim. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, who else is he? I, I believe there's another big oh, promoter that yeah, got, sh he got yeah. shot back in the day. Do you remember when he yeah. got shot? Do you remember, Ter yeah, was it Terry Marsh? <laughs> All right, Terry. Allegedly, it was Terry Marsh. Allegedly. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, with Frank Warren, what was his stance on women boxing? I mean, Frank just didn't like it. And, and so every time I was fighting and I had an interview for TV or radio, it was like, one of them would be on the on the station going, oh, they shouldn't be allowed to box. They've got PMT and the this and the that. And you're thinking, like, you know nothing about it. And both of them then went on and championed women boxing. And you're just thinking, well, if I was against Summer and, and I said, right, Daryl, I'm against it. And the next thing I'm telling you, oh, yeah, Daryl, you're ace. I'm all for it. I'm a liar. I'm fake. They're just fake people. That's but don't, don't you think they've done that because nowadays, that back money. when you was boxing, there was no hardly any money in it. It was just about pride and trying to get it legalised and things like that. But don't you think it's all about keeping up with the Joneses now and yeah. the money side so of things? It's just, it's the only thing it's about is money. There's, no, there's nothing else that it's about. If it was still... Only one or two. I mean, it won't. So when I first got the license, there was a few other women coming through, and they had a raw deal as well. But what them promoters could have done at that time was for oh, embrace me or the other girls, and and it would have been even bigger than it is now. But they're just so stupid and so small-minded small that they couldn't see what they had in front of them. And now look, you've got like the legend of Liverpool, Tasha Jonas, who's my, I, I love, I love Tash. She's my love, best mate, innit? I love what she stands for. I love what she does with the community. And and that could have been another girl from Liverpool 20 years earlier, had they give it the chance. You know, you know, the night I seen you, it was emotional seeing you at our last fight. And when you walked out, because we spoke before and we hugged it, two tears and whatever but when when you walked out you didn't even tell me you was walking out with the belt I, I, it sent shivers down my body I know when I seen you you was like oh my god that was amazing it, oh I couldn't I couldn't believe it and I take my hat off to you I take my hat off to Tasha and thanks to Tasha and Joe because they, they sort of had an inkling that Everybody knows that I made women's boxing legal everybody knows there's a big film coming People don't really know the truth when the film comes out. Yeah, people people look at things now because t I'm not just saying because Tasha's my best because Tasha's a brilliant boxer, she's a brilliant, brilliant. advocate brilliant. for women's boxing. But people think it's the likes of Tasha and Katie Taylor yeah. that made it. But 
it, none of that would have been possible. With- none of it would have been possible. And then when the 2012 Olympics happened, because uh, Nicola Adams won the gold, she was going on all like daytime TV going... Yeah, the first woman of boxing. And instead of correcting them, which I would have done if I had gone, well, I'm actually not the first woman of boxing. She never corrected them. Yeah, she never corrected them. And then, and then nowadays, the problem, I think, nowadays is social media. Social media is bad for kids and for young girls. I think it's a bad thing. And the press... Had, carry these fake people along. Nicola Adams was great what she did. Brilliant what she did. But get it right, you well, want the first. She wasn't the first. And I know I know if Tasha Jonas was asked, Tasha would always champion Tasha, you. Yeah. She, and that, Tasha Jonas she knew was, that I knew that by uh, bringing you out yeah. to carry her belt because in the last Tasha fight. Tasha Jonas knows the history of women's boxing. And she's got respect for the history of it. And she's a real person. She, she is, she is, she is real. She's real. I'll be yeah. speaking to her today at some point. Is your current state on current boxers? You- oh, so, right, the current... You see, when I was fighting, Ricky was just coming through. So Ricky Atom was, oh my God, I love Ricky. And I just loved how he was. And we had some great, great times. But... I don't really watch that much boxing, unless it's Tash, like, and, and that. But there's there's a few, there's a few coming through, but I'm just not that up, up to date. How, on it. how about promo? Is, have you, you've met Ben Shillam, haven't you? I've met Ben, yeah. how do you, What do you think of Ben? Well, I've only met him for a few minutes, so I can't really make a good decision, but he seems, he seems all right. He seems to be behind women's boxing. He, Hundred percent, and he and he seems real. Where, where Frank Warren really doesn't like it, even though they promote it for money. They just they don't real. Their heart's not in it. Where Ben's, it does seem to be in. What about that idiot Eddie Earn? What do you think? <laughs> well, again with Eddie, I said he's an idiot. You haven't said it. I said it. Do you think it's behind women's boxing or because he's got a platform and he makes big money off the likes of Kate Taylor? Yeah, I think the only reason that Ed, that Eddie's behind women's boxing is because of the money. So I boxed in um, New York on the same bill as Naz and his dad, Barry, was promoting it. Well, Barry was supposed to have been a great man. Barry was great. Apparently, he was a great man. He was and great. I'm not just saying that I've heard a lot of good things about yeah, Barry. Barry's but I think Eddie's an absolutely prick. I do, yeah. Yeah, I do. I really do. And uh, if you want to take me to court, well, it well, is what it is. I wouldn't take you to court, Daryl. You're all right with that. Say what you want, mate. <laughs> Say what you think. <laughs> Eddie, don't take him to court, mate. Just don't do it. <laughs> but, like, Eddie is what he is. And he is a young promoter. But it's all about money. And, and boxing promoters, honestly, don't care about boxers. They really don't. Can I get your... <laughs> Your view on heavyweight boxing. Who do you think is the best English heavyweight boxer? Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury. I don't think there's anyone to beat him, but you won't know till he fights Usyk. I don't believe there's anybody to beat him. Um, Can I just give you a little gift from myself, please? And this is not from myself. This is from myself and twins. uh, Wow. This is myself from Twins and Base Security. We've had this jumper made. Not everybody's going to get one of these. The D ring. I'm honoured. Oh and, my God. And you. also, the Twins are going to. Thank you, Base Security, and thank you, the Twins. Twins are going to send you the parcel. I'll get that to you at some point. When I just I'm, thought. When I'm doing. Thank you so much. When I'm doing the filming, Base Security and the Twins, I will wear this on filming. Oh, do you know what? That's really touched me out. That I really love that. Thank you. you. Can I just say thank you for, to the to the twins, to the twins who always look after me, basic security, always support things, and thanks to Buzz Rocks who get, getting behind me. Buzz Rocks is um, a Jamaican food shop in New Jamaican. Manchester, and um, he always helps me out when I'm doing work with kids. And thank you. Without people like you helping, Darren won't be able to do this. Thanks to Jane, who's an amazing woman, amazing advocate for women's boxing. She is the OG of women's boxing. 
let's not forget that, yeah? And thanks for it to coming on, tune in to the next show soon. And this has been kind of like a nervous moment because I'm in such company as such a legend. But we got there and thanks a lot. Tune in to the next one. Don't forget the D-Wing. The D-Wing.